I think there's no doubt that if you can see the humorous side of things, you can get through life rather easier than if you just uh, do me about everything. Because essentially, I think that life is absurd. Uh, it was Albert Camus said, the realization that life is absurd should not be an end, but a beginning. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment, who are going to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is the self-proclaimed Mayor of Ballam. In addition to his possibly made-up political prowess, he has built a cracking career as a comic writer and presenter, both on stage and screen. His alternative stand-up roots and routines have been rightly lauded as legendary, having stormed clubs and theatres all over the world, from the Edinburgh Fringe to the Hackney Empire. His stage play, An Evening with Gary Lineker, written with Chris England, was nominated for an Olivier Award and was adapted for television. He himself has also well adapted for television, making memorable appearances in Red Dwarf, Have I Got News For You and Grumpy Old Men, just to name a few. When he isn't leaving physical audiences in stitches, you can hear him on the airways in shows like Radio 4's Loose Ends, Excess Baggage, The Smith Lectures and Arthur Smith's Last Hangover. It's not often that our show is blessed with such mayoral majesty. Arthur Smith, welcome to the Humorology podcast. I am the Mayor of Ballam, oh yes I bloody am. I am the Mayor of Ballam, I bloody bloody am. That's my lovely song that I wrote for myself. I wrote oh, the libretto for that. <laughs> well, that's beautiful. <laughs> you, you're not sounding that convinced. <laughs> no, but uh, well, you and I go way back, so I, I was hoping that uh, I could be more convincing than that. And talking <laughs> of talking of way back, the Jesuits, which I know you're keen on, um, say, "Give me a child of seven, and I will give you the man." Was the young Arthur Smith humorous, funny? Uh, without being immodest, I would say yes, I was. I learned early on that humour was sort of my thing and it could make me popular and because uh, I remember particularly when I was about I was about seven I think at primary school and our teacher announced we were going to do a, a version of uh, Peter Pan and I was really excited by this and I went home and, and wrote my own version of Peter Pan which was obviously unperformable but she said well all right look you can, uh, we won't use your script, but you can play any part you want. So I went for Captain Hook, obviously. And then I was determined to frighten everybody in the audience, you know, the parents and the kids. So I came on with my coat hanger hand that my mother had fashioned for me, shouting and being really scary, or I thought I was, and everybody started laughing. And the scarier I tried to be, the more they laughed. At which point, I think it was about then, I kind of realised, oh, yeah, maybe actually this is quite good. People laughing is quite good. I like this. And there on in, I was always trying to make and making jokes. And I was sometimes quite rude about my friends looking back on it. I was, I was almost a bit of a bully, although the person I bullied most is now one of my closest old friends. So perhaps that doesn't count. Uh, but yes, I, I learned that making people laugh was a way of, making yourself likeable. I think, who is it, uh, Victor Borger said, the shortest distance, laughter is the shortest distance between two people. And I think that's true, because if you meet someone who don't speak their language, but you sort of make a funny noise and do that or fart or something, and they laugh, then you have a connection, even though, even though you don't know what they're saying and they don't know what you're saying. 
No, I think that's a hundred percent true, and I used to love Victor Borg. It yeah. was uh, he. Well, what for those of our listeners who don't know, who they go look him up on YouTube. Yeah. It's hilarious, deadpan with yeah. the piano, and, yeah. uh, and absolutely brilliant. Uh, beautiful. He was Danish, wasn't he? He was Danish, yeah. And by the way, he was a big hit in America as well, which was always surprising to me that he he stormed it over there as well. Um, I was recently listening again, because it, it's one of my favourite bits of radio ever, of your Radio 4 Extra show about your dad, Sid. Um, I, and I have to say, and this is absolutely true, I was talking to somebody who works on uh, the podcast, Emma, and, and she said it had me in tears and it was the most beautiful, poignant, moving, warm and funny bits of radio she'd ever heard. And I completely agree. Your dad sounds like an amazing character. And you've just said you were at seven, you knew, realised you're funny, but he was funny, wasn't it? So was there some kind of genetic mix in there? Well, I don't know if these things are genetic, but certainly he, he valued humour and he, he had loads of funny stories, particularly about being a, a policeman on the beat that he used to tell. And he loved lots of old jokes. I learned a lot of old jokes from him, which I rejected in my early years, but these days, I've, I've come to round to, to loving them again. Yes, my father, he, he was a copper, and he, he used to joke, though, with the people he had to arrest, even though he didn't really want to arrest anyone, because he'd been in the war, and he'd been a prisoner of war for two, two and a half years. He ended the war in Colditz Castle, the, the, the castle, the, the place that became famous as a board game subsequently. <laughs> and... Uh, he definitely prized humour, and he was very proud of me when I started making it in the in the world of comedy. And he used to come to shows and be very encouraging. So, uh, yes, I think there's no doubt that some families prize humour more than others, and I think those that do probably will will have a happier time of things. Well, I I think that's true. I think, and, it, and if it is valued and prized, and 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 children are praised for for doing it rather than given a cuff round the head for for it, it probably would do it. Your one of my favourite bits of the show, Sid, is when uh, you tell his Gina Lola Brigida story. Oh yeah. <laughs> which, you know, thing, which I just would, if you don't mind, I'd love you to share for our audience. I will happily do so. So uh, a man is washed up on a desert island with uh, Italian film star and a great looking woman, Gina Lola Brigida. And it's just the two of them and they find food and water and shelter. And eventually they end up sleeping together. And one day the man says, Gina, would you mind if I drew a moustache on you and called you Frank? And she said, oh, OK. So he drew a moustache and he said, Oi, Frank, you'll never guess who I'm shagging. <laughs> <laughs> Still, it's such a great gag. It's just, <laughs> it's the perfect gag and perfectly told. It was absolutely... <laughs> well, I've got plenty more of me dad's old jokes if you want to fill out the time. <laughs> oh, well, please, feel, feel free at any time that one, <laughs> one, one presents itself to you. and We could just do uh, <laughs> Arthur Smith's dad's old jokes... That's humorology right. edition yeah uh, we could do a separate podcast <laughs> yeah actually it's not a terrible idea is it um <laughs> you've probably got hundreds to be honest with you so what makes you laugh Arthur? ears <laughs> aren't they ridiculous slapped on the side of your head sort of funny, flappy, fleshy things. They're ridiculous ears. I mean, most people, you could say, you could recognise your partner from her mouth or her nose or her eyes, but not from ears. They all sort of look the same and they're stupid. And actually, I'm annoyed by ears. I've changed my mind. Ears? What the hell is going on with you? That's why I put these on to cover mine up. <laughs> <laughs> no, everything potentially makes, makes me laugh. Well, not everything, but... I mean, I, I think there's no doubt that if you can see the humorous side of things, you can get through life rather easier than if you just uh, do me about everything. Because essentially, I think that life is absurd. Uh, it was it Albert Camus who said, the realisation that life is absurd should not be an end, but a beginning. 
And being alive is a ridiculous thing. And one of the great consolations of the sadness of life is laughter. And I always think it connects us in some ways. Because if you think about it, it's such a funny sound, isn't it? <laughs> I always think it's the closest we come to saying, you know, we sound like chimpanzees when we laugh, who are, of course, our great ancestors. Although I'm not sure if animals have a sense of humour, but humour is one of the things that makes us human. And therefore, I mean, you look at someone, though, like Donald Trump, and patently, he was like a failed stand-up to me. And I think if he managed to be successful as a stand-up, we wouldn't have had all this trouble. But uh, he's someone with no sense of humour, really. Like Mrs Thatcher, I kind of think, the people I dislike politically are those probably with no sense of humour. But so that's the 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 barrier to entry for you is actually that. Well, I guess I mean I can get on with people without much of a sense of humour, but yeah, I could, I don't I think one of the things that ties you with your friends is a shared sense of humour no doubt. And if someone hasn't got a sense of humour, I don't really know what to say to them. Although I think everyone has to one degree or another. Well, that's interesting that you think everyone has. But I mean, uh, we obviously worked together for many years and uh, places like Jongleurs and the Comedy Store and all and Edinburgh and places. Uh, think how we've all seen people fail to be funny because all the open spots. Why do you think people fail to be funny? Well, uh, probably everyone fails to be funny when they first go on stage. I can think of plenty of examples. I mean, Eddie Izzard, for example, for quite a long time, everyone said, oh, no, Eddie Izzard's a gone. But then almost overnight, he found his voice. I heard a story about Jack D. that uh, I, I don't know if it's true, but I, I think it was a similar one with Les Dawson that because Jack used to do stand up and he, but he, he was doing all right, but you know, not that well. And then he decided to give it up, uh, at which, but he still had a few gigs left. But going along with that sort of, oh, I'm sick of doing this attitude, suddenly that was the voice that was his, and he started getting much bigger laughs. I think it's a question of, well, there's plenty of people who are hopeless stand ups when they start, but become quite good. And uh, it's just a question of finding your own unique voice. And that takes a time in, in, in entertainment. Well, I remember Jack because uh, we were all playing the comedy store and he was doing open spots and, and mm. he was basically happy Jack yeah. for quite a while. And then you're quite right that finding that voice. And I think that's one of the things Kim Kinney, who used to run the comedy ah, store, yeah, always Kim. used to say, yeah, always used to say, you know, you don't know who you are or mm. where, what's, what's your voice, what's your attitude. How long did it take you to find your voice? Well, uh, not that long in stand up, no, because I'd already spent, uh, I'd already done five or six years in a review company. Uh, where we did, where we, it was sketches, and, and but more often I, than not, I would begin to start doing monologues by myself. So the first time I did the comedy store, I died on my ass. But then uh, six months later, it had actually closed down by then briefly. And uh, I started getting offered to do MCing around little clubs in London and pubs. And I found myself sl through that, through and talking to the audience and only doing little bits between that somehow that 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 shot me forward and um uh so it it, it was a way i found my voice eventually uh and it wasn't too long a journey because i'd and i'd been in a band as well and i was the lead singer of a band and i used to do funny introductions to the songs and inevitably the introductions got longer than the songs so I'd spent, it's a, the key is stage time, that, you know, the more time you're on stage, the better you will eventually become. So and if, you're, that, if you're still going on your ass after two years, give up. <laughs> oh, really? But, but I think I've heard you say that it, it, you're, you're, uh, if you've never died on your ass, you're not a comedian. Yeah. 
I think every comedian must have done that. I had a terrible gig where you just, had, and then you had to walk past everyone on the way out, and they're all looking at you, thinking, "Bloody hell, who are you?" But <laughs> well, that's part of the pleasure when you do do well, because you think, "Oh yeah, that's good." But the worst thing is that that that, that when you have to walk back into the dressing room and all the heads go yeah. down, when it, yeah. thing, you just never know. mind, mate. Yeah. But you had, I think, and um, one of the hardest jobs, and you were, I, I, I'd say between five and seven people could compare well, and I, Dan, you were right up there as, as uh, you know, as being brilliant, because you had the hardest job when somebody died. You had to pick the audience up. Well, what's your tips for actually doing that? <laughs> well. Well, one thing is, in a sense, you have to register that with the audience, you both know that that person, so it's no good coming on and saying, hey, weren't they great? Brilliant, give them another round of applause because they're not going to buy that. I used to have a line that I'd stolen from, was it from an Anthony Pohl novel? I used to come on and say, well, I think we're, we can say, the least we can say about him is a, he's a reflection of the endless... Oh, damn, no, I forgot the fucking line now. <laughs> now I'm tired on the arse. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's a reflection of the infinite variety of the human personality. And people used to sort of laugh at that I sort of put the person down without being too unpleasant. I mean, you could come on. I mean, as we remember, Malcolm Hardy would probably have just come on and said, well, he was shit, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, uh, we... Uh, we... We were talking to Joe Brand about the whole Malcolm Hardy thing and the Tunnel oh, Palladium, yeah. and we all. Uh, did you have any experiences at the Tunnel Palladium that you you remember? Well, oh, quite a few. I played the opening night at the Tunnel Palladium, which was uh, for those who didn't listen to Joe, was a kind of pub stuck in the wasteland by gasworks by the Blackwall Tunnel. Uh, and yeah, it was emceed by the legendary Malcolm, who spent five years in prison, and he, he just didn't give a shit about anything in a way. Uh, well, I remember I was on last. I oh know I was on second, and the act on before me were friends of mine, and someone had thrown a bottle on stage and hit my friend, and I came on and did two gags. Uh, that were really like my best gags, and then said, "But if you think I'm doing any more, if you chuck." glasses at people fuck you and i walked off rather uh, rather self-importantly and uh, but as you remember often there the hectic was so brutal there that the shows quite often only ever lasted 20 minutes anyway because everyone had been booed off immediately well, <laughs> did you but, have but, a bad but, one that did you have any there oh Paul? oh yeah well both morris minor and the majors and the calypso twins um played it and actually generally did pretty well because actually they would you didn't know whether they were going to like you or not like you but we stopped playing it when um we went on to racist heckling when me oh. and Ainsley were going oh, on dear. one and we thought yeah no it's gone too far and I remember Ains going up to Malcolm and as you know because you know Ainsley very well as uh, as well Ainsley was really angry and he yeah, got Malcolm so. up by the wall and it went, we'll be having all the money, Malcolm. And Malcolm was like shocked and went, yeah, of course, of course, of course. You know, and yeah, yeah. Because it was, it was horrible. But they were, I mean, they were, they had like this group thing. It was like they all, they all got together and well, discussed. Well, some of them did, as I understand. And they used to oh, practice really? heckles. Because uh, there, there was one time, there was one guy who used to heckle in Latin. <laughs> <laughs> That the other seem to understand. Nun sum quarat or you know, which is quite a novelty. Yeah, it, it was. So talking about heckling, um, should a good comedian or anybody, I mean, not everybody on our podcast will be comedians, obviously, are people who have to make speeches at weddings or, or business on everything, should they welcome heckles? Because I think you and I agree that they, everybody should welcome heckles because it can actually make the make the thing go better. Oh, absolutely, yeah, because you're engaging with the audience. I mean, I'm not sure how good it is if someone's, yeah, if someone's doing racist heckle, then I think they've just got yeah. to be thrown out or something. But, uh, oh, yeah, and because and another thing about that is that people know that this is genuinely spontaneous. This is not something you've written down, although there are anti-heckle lines, obviously. But... Uh, 
Actually, I heard that, although and sometimes the heckles can be just too brutal. I was doing a gig a while back with this guy. Uh, I won't say it was, but he was even older than me and he wasn't doing terribly well. And suddenly a woman's voice rang out from the audience saying, excuse me, I think you really need to think about the way your life is going. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not just your acting shit, so is the whole point of your existence. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, God. Yeah, I mean, I mean some was... heckles you just have to accept it and walk off, I think. Oh, was it the old Glasgow Apollo one where it was Mike, Bur Mike and Bernie Winters? And uh, they, they, Mike and Bernie Winters were on. And, and, and Michael Winters used to come on and do a little bit yeah. of uh, hello, how are you and everything. And then yeah. Bernie would put his head around the curtain and yeah. Mike was dying on his ass. And the, the Glasgow Apollo audiences were like just silent. And when Bernie put his head around the audience, somebody in the audience just goes, oh, fuck, there's two of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard that story. No, I think I heard that story about Morgan and Wise. Also, oh, really? the Glasgow Empire, that's the sound. It's an apocryphal yeah. story, isn't it? It? Yeah, yeah. Well, it probably did happen to someone somewhere, or I don't know. So what was your favourite heckle and heckle put-down as well? I mean... Well, I used to have a couple of put-downs. I used to say, if someone was there, I said, nice to see the Bishop of Durham enjoying himself. I used to say <laughs> someone. And then I'd say, I remember you. I shit you yesterday or something. If it was getting a bit... Uh, and then there's, uh, there's... I remember another incident when I was in Edinburgh. And uh, I was in the audience at uh, Late and Live, which you oh, may God. remember. Yeah, I would do well. To sort of start at Zoom. midnight and really, you know, everyone was drunk. And, uh, but I was in the audience and there was a, the, the actor who was on, he was, I mean, I didn't, I found him slightly objectionable. You know, he said to someone, you've got a, did your mouth bleed once a month or something? And I remember thinking, oh, that's not very good. Anyway, and then I started hacking him. I can't remember what I said, but I was getting quite a big laughs. And he said, oh, yeah. I mean, he didn't know who I was. He couldn't see or anything in the audience. He said, oh, yeah, you think this is funny? You think this is easy, do you, doing this stand-up? Well, why don't you try coming up and having a go? So I said, all right. And then I took him about 20 minutes. <laughs> I remember another incident where... Um, I was at Jonglers and there were this bunch of blokes who were obviously pissed and they were out together and they had been heckling all night. And then and then right at the end of the evening, I said, you have been a right pain. I said, I think the least you could do is come up here and give us a song. So what about uh, Lion Sleeps Tonight? Now, I wasn't really expecting this to happen. So do you remember uh, Wim Mawek? Wim Mawek. Wim Mawek. Wim and I Wim said, Wim come on, I'll start you off. A whim away, and then they all started doing it. And then they did all come up on stage, and then one of them stepped forward for the opening line, you know, we in the jungle. So he could, and this guy, he sang, he had the most beautiful voice, and they did this sensational version of it. And it turned out they were actually a choir oh. who were out on the piss. <laughs> and it just like at the end, it was just the most astonishing end to an evening as they sang. Lion sleeps tonight. A bunch of sort of unruly drunks suddenly turned into this glorious choir. One of the things I always talk to people about, especially in business, is about listening. Yes, that, that's that really. Yeah, well, but you know, you spent spent your life on stage uh, doing it. But what you're doing is you're really listening. And if you get a quiet heckle, or somebody says something funny, actually, you've got a microphone. You repeat it. Yeah. And then you get the laugh. Yeah, you steal the laugh of them. And uh, and also, uh, you should be able to control the situation because you're, A, you've got a microphone, B, the lights are on you, C, you're probably slightly less drunk than they are. <laughs> uh, so you should be able to, to keep, to, to, own, to ride with the moment. And sometimes, I mean, there are there are comedians who just improvise all the way through and just talk to the crowd, which is, you know, a brave and uh, often wonderful thing to do. You know, people like Dylan Moran and, yeah. Well, it's a high wire act at that point, isn't it, really? Yes. You know, it, it, and people love that. I mean, and comedy is so great when it's on that sort of, it could well, go But that's why impro, way. you know, is has been... Uh, it, you know, is really so popular, and the comedy store players are 
still going into their 60s now. Well, exactly. And you and I have both guested with them over the years. Haven't That's we? right. Yes. But yeah. did you find that because uh, I or I mean, I loved it. And I, I I think you were at the same time when Mike Myers was doing it um, oh, yeah. with us and taught us all the games in the afternoons and things like that. And uh, I loved it. But it was the one thing that scared me more than anything else uh, in, in, in comedy. You know, if I could... I, be on stage or have a guitar or have know where I was going. It was like a safety net. And I think the comedy store players call it comedy without a safety net. Yeah, yeah. Did it but that, of course, you? As you say, there are techniques. And I mean, I, I didn't realise that when I was speaking early on. I mean, if someone says something to you, you have to essentially agree with it and expand upon it. Don't ever say no. That's the key to uh, improv. Yes. You just got to go with the flow. Yeah, yes, and is the thing. Yes, um, right. That, yes, and you, 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 you build on that. So you've always looked because a lot of our listeners, you know, their number one fear is public speaking. Mm. So you've always looked unbelievably comfortable on stage. Um, is there anything you can share that that might help people to to feel more comfortable? To well. Listen, like you say, try and be comfortable in yourself. Uh, have a couple of things up your sleeve if need be, but rest- respond to the, the nowness of the moment, I, I think. Uh, I understand for most people, yeah, public speaking is absolutely terrifying because everyone's looking at you. But if you just can try and be yourself as natural as you can to listen to people, even if you're nervous, which you probably will be, just try and forget that and just focus on the moment that you're up there doing that. Yeah, I I agree, because the the first chapter in my first book was uh, uh, the Pitching Bible was called It's All About Them. And I think Mm. people who do this really well, like yourself, who are think you are actually invested in the audience, not in your own head. If you know what I mean, it's yeah. it's you allow the unconscious mind to do it. Like when we're having a chat here, or if we meet for a coffee or uh, something, we we don't come with notes, do we? And go, no. you know. Well, in a way, that's what comedy is and improvisation. It's just you know that you, you you're not yeah you're not reading notes when you're talking to someone. You're right. It's a conversation, and you're quite happy doing it if you can get that degree of self-confidence when you're on a stage that's the key to it so is it essentially a trust exercise whereby you you are you are trusting that something will come because usually what stops people is oh fuck i don't know what to say and we've all had that moment at which point you have to put your attention somewhere else do you think people generally in in normal workplaces laugh enough is, is humour actually enough or is it being sort of like taken out of workplaces and this is, you know, this is now serious? And did people laugh more? Well, the day? I, I, mean, I, 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 sp- I speak as someone who's never really been in workplaces that much, so I can't really comment. I mean, I've never sort of been in an office and surrounded by other people in the office. But I imagine that must be one of the things that would be good for an office to... to binds everybody together if you've got like some communal jokes and uh and you know if something terrible happens well well we'll have had a bit of a laugh of it instead uh i don't know what's your experience of that paul i just think it i think there's a lot of hierarchy that mm. stops humor mm. and so therefore when when you get a hierarchy people don't want to you know yeah. play and tease and and you know that's chide i think the word i'd like to bring back which nobody uses anymore i think is gentle chiding chiding with, uh, yes yeah when when i think and that's where the the life and the comes back into a workplace is when people can chide and play and do that but if you've got a boss who's very much on the hierarchical system and you know Mm. um that like the old frost show sketch of you know i look down on him yes you know with uh actually i i did a i did some corporate zoom a while back 
where, and I have this joke where I pick out a name. I mean, I've usually got the name before, or sometimes I just make it up. So, is there anybody here tonight called um, uh, Paul? Yeah, no, we won't say you, Paul. Is there anyone here tonight called Danny Paulie? Uh, Danny, and they say, yeah, so Danny, some of your friends have come up to me tonight. They've asked me to say they think you're a bit of a wanker, mate. And I did this when I, I did it with the boss as the, the wanker. And I'm not entirely sure, but I've noticed I haven't had another booking from them <laughs> since. <laughs> well, I'm sure when he got away with it, if he'd someone lower down the hierarchy, probably. Yeah, but isn't that indicative of a corporate culture, though? Mm. Because uh, I, I, I've talked to uh, a few people who, when they've done corporates, and actually I don't think it was Joe, Joe Brand, who was saying it's indicative. Though if the boss can take a joke, it's generally yeah. a good sign yeah. that it filters down into other people. And the, 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 Have you found yeah, that? So You've done hundreds of corporates over the years, haven't you? Well, I don't really do them so much anymore. I, I think I'm a bit too wild for most corporate gigs. So if anyone wants to book me for a corporate gig, here I am. <laughs> well, you, you won't go Because uh, I've said some of those have not gone well. I remember I did one, what was it for? I did one where it was a bunch of car salesmen, and I did a whole load of routines about how I hate cars, which, looking back on it, was probably not a very good idea. <laughs> if I asked you to write a business case for why humour should be more for, for everybody in business, this could be in, you know, offices, it could be in factories, it could be a thing. Why do you think it's, it's actually useful as a tool and, you know... Well, I, I don't really know about business, but there's no doubt that humour is something that will always bring people together. And obviously, I imagine you know, in a workplace, if everyone is enjoying each other's company, then they're going to be much more productive, I imagine. So, yes, I would cultivate you. Although, don't you know, some people are quite shy and you have to be gentle with them. But even the shy, you know, shy people are often the funniest when you give them a chance. So uh, it's just a question of creating an atmosphere where people feel comfortable making a little joke and that in turn will bring them together. That's what I'd say. So it's, it's a culture, basically create a culture. But do you think, I mean, things like creativity are more enhanced by humour because uh, if you, it goes back to what we were talking about, the comedy store players and uh, the having a set of rules, if you like, that allow you to play, to be, to be creative. And if you are going, um, somebody says, you know, um, I hope we get can land this plane properly. And you go, we're not in a plane. <laughs> it shuts everything down. Yeah, but um, if you are in a plane and you've got to land it properly, then that would probably be slight. Well, I don't know, even then it might be. <laughs> yeah, maybe that would be funny, even if you were in a plane. Well, yeah. <laughs> But allowing the culture and the and the atmosphere to to go, it's. I think one of the things that um, you have perfected. Oh, well, you had it from the start, but is is an attitude of of warmth. And yes, I, well, I because so. even when you're taking the piss, it's it's done with love, isn't it? Yes, I mean that's one of the things about stand-up is is status you know some people some people deliberately play low status which is oh i don't really know what's going on and then other people play high status i suppose i'm more like that where you're sort of telling people about the world but the king is then though is to to listen to everyone else and to recognize that you don't really know what the fuck you're talking about necessarily because in the end none of us do <laughs> <laughs> No, well, that's true, but then that's... Uh, is that the ability to laugh at yourself? Yes, uh, yes, as you well? have to be able to do that. I think if you don't do that, then you might come over as arrogant. And uh, the key is to recognise your own weaknesses, even if you're trying to tell people about the world. I mean, I, I'm a bit of a Plato man who said, uh, you know, the only thing I know is that I know nothing. And, uh, yes, I can punch my opinions out there but I don't really know because just we're such a tiny little specks in the immensity of universes that what the hell do we know really nothing so let's have a laugh and uh, 
and uh, enjoy ourselves while we're here. I, I, I have wise words. Why are we drawn to people who make us laugh so much? What What is that, that compulsion? Well, I suppose it shows an understanding of the absurdity of life. And that always brings people together. Well, having said that, I mean, I like Donald Trump again. He, he does not at all funny. And yet people worship him, although perhaps they don't think he's being funny. I mean, he tries to be funny, but it's always just so awful. So I'm not sure if he isn't a, a denial of that point of yours, but humour is what brings us together in the end from wherever you are in the world. Every country, every human has some element of humour. And even if you don't know, you know, if you, if you look different, your skin colour's different, you speak a different language, you've never been in the same place together. But humour can still bring you together. That's what I'd say. Yeah, no, I think it's very important that people understand that you are going to make yourself more employable, more attractive, mm -hmm. more thing by finding the funny. Yeah, well, that was one of the things I learned early on that that's one of the reasons I went into stand up because, you know, I was more attractive to women if I'd been entertaining them on stage in front of a large crowd than if I was just sort of sidling up to them from shifting obscurity, which had sort of been my early technique. <laughs> Yeah, and laughter is good for making people like you. And if they're funny too, then you like them. Yeah, and uh, I think, is it also intoxicating? Uh, in oh, the yeah, sense? of course, and it's catching, isn't it? I mean, it, there's nothing funnier, is there, than when someone corpses on the, on the radio or television and the other people start laughing along with them. I mean, it's infectious, isn't it, laughter? Uh, so in a way that, say, belching isn't. <laughs> the yawning might be actually if everybody starts you know if everyone in the room starts yawning you probably would too maybe i don't know about that but laughter is the thing i mean you you know it's, it's an involuntary thing laughter like like belching or farting or but we don't pay to go into rooms to get people to make us belch or fart do we but we do pay to make them to, for them to make us laugh yeah, and and does that become like a drug? Because I think it does. You see, I I, I think once you've had that high, I think yeah. you you really are addicted to it in a certain yeah, way. Yeah, well, that was one of the things. A lot of comedians found it very hard during the pandemic. Is you just miss people laughing with you or at you, or you know, you miss the the the, the exciting moment on stage. I remember one very funny moment, one time when I laughed a great deal was when I was, I was doing a version of Hamlet in Edinburgh years ago in the mid nineties. And it was kind of a comic version, but not entirely. But I'd, I'd done two tryouts before I got to Edinburgh, which had both been a fucking disaster. And so then I, but then I went on stage my first show at the Pleasance in Edinburgh and there were like critics in the audience and various people I knew and I was terrified, but it actually went really well at the end. And then I took me applause, went out the back and I slipped over and fell on a banana skin onto my ass into a puddle. And I don't know if anyone ever had actually fallen on a banana skin before, but and I, I thought, well, this is hilarious. And I just laughed and laughed and laughed as I lay there with the banana skin stuck to my ass. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lovely image. <laughs> We've now come to the part of the show that we like to call quick fire questions, Arthur. Oh yes, okay. Quick fire questions. Who's the funniest business person, i.e. non-comedian, that you've met? That I've met uh, Barack what? Obama. Oh, really? When did you meet Barack Obama? This is a story I want to hear. Uh, in my imagination. Oh, uh, I thought I see. he was really funny. <laughs> that was one of the things about Obama. He just said, God, he's so good. He'd even dance well, couldn't he? And, uh, all right, now I'll give you another one. The funniest person I've ever is probably my partner, Beth, who just endlessly makes me laugh when I'm not in the doghouse, obviously. <laughs> 
No, Beth is very, very funny. What book makes you laugh? Diary of a Nobody by George Grossly. What film makes you laugh? Uh, ooh, quite a few. Oh, what's the famous one about the band? Oh, geez, I forgot the name. You know, Spinal about... Tap. This yeah, is Spinal, Spinal Tap. Tap. Yeah, this is fine. I'm sure I'm not the first to have said that. I thought that was one of the funniest things I'd ever seen. Uh, it, it is still genius. And uh, if, uh, I, I'm friends with Mark Bedford from Madness and we will go out for long lunches yeah. where there will just be every line from yeah. Spinal Ooh, Tap. Oh, I want to go and watch it again in a minute. Oh, yeah, no, it is brilliant and worth, worth catching again. Um, taking a shift to the other side and going um, to a different direction, what is not funny? Death is... Well, unless it's someone you really hate, but <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. Death isn't very funny. But but death can be funny because you just did a gag about it. That's true. I suppose it, it can be funny if it's but not if it if it's your own uh, someone who's close to you, or maybe your own death might be funny. Maybe that's the last thing that happens, just as you drift off in, in your consciousness goes. You're in a great big hall of laughter. That would be a nice thought. That that that. That's good. Yeah, no, I like that. What word makes you laugh? Kipper. Kipper? Yeah. Oh, Kipper. A, it's got yeah. a K, double P, and it's a funny fish. And I laugh <laughs> when I hear the word kipper. <laughs> it's funny. What sound makes you laugh? Well, a fart, obviously. I mean, that's one of the great pleasures of life. I mean, some people never really get beyond it. I mean, when you're about eight, farting, obviously, is the funniest thing ever. But it never really stops being funny. I mean, if if some, you know, world leader does a fart unexpectedly during something, it is just everyone will find it funny. I don't know why, but farting is funny. Trump trumping would probably be... <laughs> yeah. yeah. That'll go viral. Yeah. Let's all go yeah. viral, man. <laughs> uh, would you rather be considered clever or funny? Probably funny, especially since I'm going to be a comedian, not an academic. <laughs> but it'd be nice to be both, but uh, yeah, probably funny. But don't you think that in order to be funny, you kind of have to, you've known most comedians um, that have uh, come from Britain in the last 40 years. Um, are most of them quite clever as well? Well, it depends what you mean by clever. But yes, I suppose they're quite adept at thinking. And because you have to be, there's a degree of cleverness that, that's involved in writing funny material. Yes, no doubt. So, yeah, all right. Then I'd like to be funny and clever. <laughs> OK, you've got it. And <laughs> finally, and I'm hoping this will be one of Sid's gags, but <laughs> desert island gags, you can only take one joke with you to a desert island, Arthur. What is it? All right, I'll uh, let's go with this one. So, well, oh, should I do that one? No, I'll do this one. Two balloons get married and have a little baby balloon and they all sleep together in bed and it's lovely. But eventually baby balloon gets a bit too big and his mum says, sorry, I'll have to sleep next door now. So he goes in next door and he's lying there one night and he misses being in with mum and dad. So while they're asleep, he sneaks back in between them. But he lets a bit of air out of his mum and then out of his dad and out of himself. And then they're all lovely. But he wakes up in the morning to find his mother is furious. Look what you've done, she says. You've let me down. You've let your father down. And then everyone can fill in the last punchline, which I always think is a nice thing. Worst of all, you've let yourself down. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Uh, <laughs> as ever, brilliant, funny, and so joyous to be with. Lovely Arthur to Smith. speak to you, Paul. Arthur Smith, thank you so much for being on the Humorology Podcast. Cheers, Paul. The Humorology Podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production. <laughs>